just a few things. Uh, uh, the uh, you know, Seward Co-op is located in Minneapolis. Many of you probably know that. Uh, I've been the GM for 10 years. I actually started my co-op career at Seward back in uh, uh, 1992. I worked five years at the very first store. We're in our third location, and right now we're building a second store. Uh, but we grew, uh, when I started, we were doing $6 million a, a year in sales. Uh, we're, uh, we hit $12 million in the in the second location that we were at. Kind of leading up to that, we decided to build another, uh, relocate the store. And at this point this year, we'll hit uh, $32 million in sales. So we've had just tremendous growth at our co-op. We have about 230 employees, 12,000 owners. Well, one of the things that, from the start, when I became the general manager, having worked in co-ops for a long time, and having sat at pretty much every spot at the table. I've been a director, I've been a frontline employee, and then I became the GM, was I really wanted to try to operationalize the, the values and principles of cooperation. Uh, because those are really what fired me as a person in my life and why I you know, pretty much dedicated my life to working in co-ops. Um, and so one of the things I also had uh, when I was uh, started at Seward in the same month I uh, got a scholarship to uh, a master's program, the only master's program for co-ops and credit unions in the entire uh, D of English-speaking North America. Uh, and that's at uh, St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And one of the things that uh, I, I learned in that was uh, this paradigm that the, uh, one of the uh, courses had of uh, 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 some reading materials from this guy named Daniel Cote. And it, he called it the new cooperative paradigm. And he basically studied credit unions in uh, Quebec, which for those of you who don't know, the, the Desjardins movement in Quebec is really large. It's a pretty significant part of the economy there. And he argued that loyalty is at the root of ownership and uh, participation uh, you know, is really key to the business success. And so the question became, you know, this participation that owners have in their, in their co-op um, is at the root a very strong cooperative advantage. But the other thing he said, though, that was on the less positive side and was somewhat of a concern to me, is that large co-ops risk losing that advantage. Um, the, uh, they become too focused on uh, the business needs. The, um, they lose intimacy with the customers. Uh, and they lose tr a sense of their collective purpose. And, and that, you know, uh, really uh, reflects in the experience that people have when they come in the store. That it's just a shopping experience or it's just a credit union experience, just another place to go banking. And he, his argument was that to really regain the cooperative advantage, the, you know, the paradigm was that you had to do that through staff empowerment. And that was really essential that it be based on the values of cooperation. And I know we have them all around the room here, uh, but you know, before that, you saw these in the, the room, the, the values of, cooper, of the ICA Statement of Cooperative Identity. How many people in this room actually knew that besides the principle, there were a set of values? You know, it's one of those things that we often jump over, though. You know, we think, you know, when we have conversation about our cooperative identity, we always talk about the cooperative principles. But I think actually is as important as the cooperative principles are those values. And, you know, I have them on the screen. I didn't know that we were going to have them all around the room. But I, <laughs> which was kind of like, well, that's, that's kind of great. Uh, uh, but it, it's really one of these things where, you know, co-ops are, are, you know, based on these values. And how do you operationalize them? As a general manager of a cooperative that's growing really rapidly, I really ask myself, how do we operationalize it? And so at the very starting point, you know, for a policy governance co-op like ourselves, you know, we start with the end statement, obviously. You know, um, uh, Seward's co-op uh, end statement is that we'll sustain a healthy community that has equitable economic relationships, positive environmental impacts, and inclusive socially responsible practices, which inco incorporate a lot of these, these values here. We started policy governance in 2005, and we actually uh, articulated this end statement in 2008. Um, during that time, we grew from 6 to 12 million. And, you know, we decided in 2006 that we were going to relocate our co-op. That actually created a whole lot of dialogue at the staff level about the meaning of growth. And it was really something that drove us to uh, ask ourselves in the staff, you know, what is it that we're about? How are we going to not lose sense of our purpose? How are we going to not lose sense of our cooperative values? And so at the same time as all that happened, 
I, I learned in my master's program about social audits. And the idea around a social audit is that in addition to like demonstrating to your uh, owners or your members the uh, financial performance of the co-op, you also identify indexes that you uh, measure to show your progress for your social purpose. And, and that's really, I think, uh, where we went at Seward. And so the staff, <clears throat> I, I created the team. I was really busy working on the relocation project. You know, we needed to raise a million and a half and do a very complex project. And um, so the staff, I, I dedicated, and actually one of our staff members who was on the leader of that was, is here in the room, Allison, uh, who's our, uh, our governance uh, employee, used to be on our board for a number of years as well. Um, but we created the, the scorecard, which had uh, four high-level uh, statements uh, about what we're doing. And they're committed. They're, they're, they're stated in the form of commitments. This was written in 2006. And just to kind of give you an example of some of the data that we track, we have three to four data points for each of those four commitments. And it's on our website every quarter. So this is pulled up just for the commitment uh, to the, our financial commitment to the community, what kind of sales we have. So we try to share with uh, our members and anyone who's interested what exactly is the amount of sales that we have to different things that are really important to us who associate with the co-op. Um, the um, thing that was really impressive is that we, we actually did a, you know, a, a member survey and 62% of our owners knew about the scorecard. It was really impressive. Uh, we also uh, started a whole new uh, effort as well uh, after that around uh, trying to identify the products that people really value. I wanted to talk about principle six, which some of you might be familiar with, uh, which is the cooperative trade movement that we formed with six or seven other co-ops. I think there's about nine co-ops. Eastside uh, is in that. Uh, Vroke was in it. Uh, and basically, the idea around principle six was to be able to identify the product sources uh, to the consumer. And I won't go through all the uh, uh, elements, but one thing, the thing that's really important about it, it gave a real good feedback loop of community benefit based on our values. And the thing that we uh, learned uh, from the P6 uh, 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 effort was it really resonated, especially with younger consumers, people who were in their you know, 25 to 35 uh, age range when we did our, our member survey. And, and that was really helpful you know, to know that this really makes a difference in their buying decisions that they want to know where their product comes from. And so what is it? So local, cooperative, small farmer. And so if two of those three attributes are in place, that product gets an at the, the P6 logo on the point of sale. And so we're able to you know, ra you know, operationalize the things that our consumers were telling us that were really important. I mean, we all, if we're in retail, you know, retailers and managers, we've often heard the story of someone coming in you know, really upset with us because they discovered that Cascadian Farm isn't some nice little farm in Oregon, but it's owned, you know, owned by, you know, General Mills. And, you know, you have to explain that there's been a lot of consolidation in the industry, blah, blah, blah. This is a way to actually help consumers identify it and bring our values to the, to the, to the forefront. Um, uh, one of the things that we do at Seward, I think, to help make that operationalized of uh, employees' involvement in the... Um, uh, cooperative values is through education. We have a really strong, you know, commitment. I mean, like most stores, we have a, you know, core curriculum for all new staff. We send a lot of people to uh, training events like Rising Stars and Retail's Basics. But the one thing that we do that I don't think anyone else does is we commit to having one employee every year in that master's program. So um, right now we have three students in the program. And the idea around that is to build the, the basic understanding of cooperatives within the staff. Because at the very end of the day, the ability for the co-op to meet the cooperative experience requirement, you know, to make, uh, co you know, have customers feel like they've had a good co-op experience, it's through the staff. And the only way we're really going to reach a lot of people is through staff empowerment. And so the last thing that I just wanted to say was that I think we need to give our staff the tools to not just be good grocers, because we do a lot of, you know, energy uh, in training people to be good grocers but to be great cooperators, so thanks. <laughs>